describes the dogma, you might say, of the Mass and the, the Surprise of Twelfth. And um, then we'll get into the theology of the Mass, which I'll take from Gavin de Lagrange. Uh, various interesting things about the Mass, for example, how Christ is the principal priest of the Mass. Some mystic theology. So, uh, so this is a, uh, no. I have to put this on, right? Yes, you're asking to. All right. Can I sit? Yes. All right. Just the little microphone there. Just clip it on here. Can I stand? <laughs> Doesn't matter. You just take. Can I stand here? Yes. Okay. Just take the little microphone. Just put it on the plastic. So just what do I do with this? I just put it in your pocket. Oh, oh I have a phone in there. That's probably not a good idea. It shouldn't make a difference. Take it out and turn it off. We're live streaming even now. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So the um, reading first from Mediator Day. I, I left out the parts where he condemns certain um, modern trends and so forth, and other things that are devotional. This is just what the Mass is, and you have to, in order to understand the sacred liturgy of the Mass and to understand all the prayers of the Mass, you have to understand first what it is. All right. So, mediator between God and men, the and high priest who has gone before us into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, quite clearly had one aim in view when he undertook the mission of mercy, which was to endow mankind with the rich blessings of supernatural grace. Sin had disturbed the right relationship between man and his Creator. The Son of God would restore it. That's a very important point. Uh, the, the human race is so burdened by sin that it almost, and that's underlined, almost enters into his definition. In other words, it is a doctrine of the church that he cannot long persevere in natural virtue without grace. He will eventually fall into mortal sin. So he is a severely wounded creature, and all of the life of earth is overshadowed by sin. It is a problem of human beings. They act badly. They offend God. They go to hell except for 
a Savior who will restore them to grace. That's a very important point to understand. What is against that is naturalism, that we are here, we have evolved from gorillas, and that we are here to have a good life and then die like a squirrel, like the squirrel died, a, a, you know, recently, die like a squirrel or a dog on the street, and then everybody forgets about you. They burn you up in cremation, and then you're forgotten about, and that's that. See, but the, the, the idea is a good, nice life here. Okay. That is naturalism. It is, and, and it is a failure to understand sin, and, and, the, and those people who are naturalists are going to commit a lot of sins because they reject the Savior and the grace of the Savior. That is a, you will never understand the Catholic religion or the Mass or the sacraments or the priesthood unless you understand that. So that, that's a very important point that he's making there. The children of Adam were wretched heirs to the infection of original sin. He would bring them back to their heavenly Father, the primal source and final destiny of all things. So it's a restoration of order to the human intellect by faith and to the human will by charity. Supernatural. And it is accomplished by grace. But I mean, when you think of all of the wars and the, the cruelty of human beings, all, everything that's going on today, all of the superstition, all of the error, the incredible errors that enter into human beings' minds over the centuries, all of this sick stuff that you see going on today, you know, transgenderism, all of those sick, sick things, it's all due to original sin, that he cannot order his mind correctly, he is a broken vehicle, and that is why Christ came to save the human race. That's why the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass exists. That's why the Church exists. That's why the priesthood exists. The sacraments exist. It's something to contemplate, the restoration of the human race by the sacrifice of Christ. For this reason, he was not content while he dwelt with us on earth, merely to give notice that redemption had begun and to proclaim the long-awaited kingdom of God, but gave himself besides in prayer and sacrifice to the task of saving souls, even to the point of offering himself as he hung from a cross, a vi the victim, a victim unspotted unto God, to purify our conscience of dead works to serve the living God. And that's a quote from St. Paul. Thus happily we were all men summoned back from the byways, leading them down to ruin and disaster, to be set squarely once again upon the path that leads to God. Thanks to the shedding of the blood of the Immaculate Lamb, now each might set about the personal task of achieving his own sanctification, so rendering to God the glory due to him. That, that is in a nutshell, the whole redemption of man. But what is more, the divine Redeemer has so willed it that the priestly life begun with the supplication and sacrifice of his mortal body should continue without intermission down the ages in his mystical body, which is the church. So the incarnation is an extension, excuse me, the church is an extension of the incarnation and the holy sacrifice of the mass and the sacraments are extensions of the redemption through time so that the life of Christ and the passion of Christ are not simply a historical thing. They continue in the Catholic Church, the incarnation and the redemption, that is, in effect. They continue in their effects in the Catholic Church. So that's why there are priests to carry on the public life of our Lord, you might say, and also to carry on His passion and death in the Mass. So you preach, you teach. It, it's to apply the effects of the redemption through time. 
That is why he established a visible priesthood to offer everywhere the clean oblation. That means an unbloody oblation. And that, uh, that's, that's uh, Malachias who predicted that. Which would enable men from east to west, freed from the shackles of sin, to offer God that unconstrained and voluntary homage which their conscience dictates. In obedience, therefore, to her founder's behest, the Church prolongs the priestly mission of Jesus Christ mainly by means of the sacred liturgy, what I just said. She does this in the first place at the altar where constantly the sacrifice of the cross is represented. -pre it's a better way to pronounce that. It's not represented. It's represented, presented again. And with a single difference in manner of its offering renewed. So it is, it is as if the, the, the cross has never gone away. It is, it is as if Christ is still, still suffering on the cross by his, the extension of the cross in the Mass and the application of the effects of the, the cross. Obviously, Christ is not suffering in heaven. He suffers no more. But he willed that his sacrifice continue because that is the center of the history of humanity. All humanity looks forward to it, and after the crucifixion, all humanity looks back to it. She does it by means of the sacraments, those special channels through which men are made partakers in the supernatural life. She does it finally by offering to God all good and great, the daily tribute of her prayer and praise. So just the prayers of the faithful, the rosaries, everything else that you say are all part of this homage given to God through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. All of those things have value because they are attached to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. What a spectacle for heaven and earth, observes our predecessor of happy memory, Pius XI, is not the church at prayer. For centuries without interruption, from midnight to midnight, the divine psalmody of the inspired canticles is repeated on earth, referring to the divine office. There is no hour of the day that is not hallowed by its special liturgy. There is no state of human life that has not its part in the thanksgiving, praise, supplication, and reparation of this common prayer of the mystical body of Christ, which is his church. No sooner, in fact, is the word made flesh than he shows himself to the world vested with a priestly office making to the Eternal Father an act of submission which will continue uninterruptedly as long as he lives. When he cometh into the world, he saith, Behold, I come to do thy will. So already he is offering himself. It is his offertory. Bethlehem is his offertory. It is his oblation. I have come to do thy will. Just as there's an offertory of the Mass. See, we're going to learn later that what makes a sacrifice a sacrifice, the soul of sacrifice, you might say, is the oblation, the offering. And he did that when he was born. The act he was to consummate admirably in the bloody sacrifice of the cross. It is in this will we are sanctified by the oblation of the body of Jesus Christ once. All right, that's from Hebrews. He plans his active life among men with no other purpose in view except to die on the cross. As a child, he is presented to the Lord in the temple. To the temple he returns as a grown boy and often afterwards to instruct the people and to pray. He fasts for 40 days before the beginning of his public ministry. His counsel and example summon all to prayer daily and at night as well. Often you see him in the gospel going off to himself to pray. 
As teacher of the truth, he enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world, that's from St. John, to the end that mortals may duly acknowledge the immortal God, not withdrawing unto perdition, but faithful to the saving of the soul. It's Hebrews. As shepherd, he watches over his flock, leads it to life-giving pasture, lays down a law that none shall wander from his side, off the straight path he has pointed out, and that all shall lead holy lives imbued with his spirit and moved by his active aid. At the Last Supper, he celebrates a new Pasch. See, the Pasch was the um, sacred meal that was, and sacrifice, sacrifice and consumption of the sacrifice, that was done at the command of God when the Hebrews were about to leave Egypt. They were to get a spotless lamb, kill it, and, uh, and roast it, and they would all stand ready with, all ready to leave with staffs and everything and eat the sacred lamb. And they would take the blood of the lamb and paint it around their doorposts and the angel of death would skip their houses. So the angel of death came and struck all of the houses of the Egyptians, took the firstborn of every Egyptian house, including the animals, and the Jews were able to depart. So that was their redemption. You see, the, the Paschal, of all the sacrifices of the Old Testament, that's the most important. <clears throat> and we'll look at the sacrifices of the Old Testament because you need to understand those for the Mass too. But that was most important. That's why Easter, you know, you see, Pascha Nostrum, St. Paul says, Pascha Nostrum Immolatus as Christus. Our Pasch, Christ, has been immolated. See, that's the epistle of Easter Sunday. Uh, this is now our Pasch. So that, that, is, that is a direct prefiguration of the redemption of Christ, the freedom from death, from, from the angel of death, the freedom from that as, as a result of the blood of Christ. So it, it, you have to understand that. So, uh, so the Last Supper was, was celebrated as the Pasch, See, first he did the Paschal meal, or the Paschal sacrifice, and the, then he did the Last Supper. Then he did the consecration of his body and blood. So that was liturgically the end of Judaism and the beginning of Christianity, liturgically. And then the next day he would die on the cross, and when he died, the curtain split in the temple, which was the end of Judaism as a religion. The New Testament was now in place. That curtain was very, very thick and was made of cloth of gold, solid gold, and ripped. The curtain was a sign of the presence of God among the Hebrew people. It was a very sacred thing. And on it was embroidered uh, vines because Israel was the vineyard of the Lord. So our Lord's parable concerning the vineyard, etc., was very clear to the Jews. So all of this tremendous amount of symbol, yes? What happened to that veil? Was it preserved? I don't know. Maybe the Romans got it or something. I don't know what happened to it, but that, that's uh, the commentators, that's what the commentators say about the veil. That it was not just some curtain that you would buy at Walmart or something. This, this was you know, something very, very sacred. And uh, it, it veiled the Holy of Holies, which was the uh, Ark of the Covenant and, the, and the, the Cherubim and all. And that would be entered only once a year by the high priest. So the, uh, that's, so. Um, so uh, on the morrow, <coughs> excuse me, he celebrates a new Pasch with solemn rite and ceremonial, and provides for its continuance through the divine institution of the Eucharist. Do this in commemoration of me. On the morrow, lifted up between heaven and earth, he offers the saving sacrifice of his life and pours forth, as it were, from his pierced heart the sacraments destined to impart the treasures of redemption to the souls of men. So that the, the, uh, so the, the piercing of his heart uh, there came out blood and water, and that was not simply a trickle, according to the commentators. That was like a waterfall that came out. 
it was a supernatural event. It wasn't just that he didn't have any more blood in him. It was a supernatural event indicative of the sacraments pouring forth from his, his, his heart. All this he does with but a single aim, the glory of his Father and man's ever greater sanctification. But it is his will besides that the worship he instituted and practiced during his life on earth shall continue ever afterwards without intermission. For he has not left mankind an orphan. So he didn't ascend into heaven and goodbye. No. Saint Alphonse said that our Lord would never have ascended into heaven if he could not have left himself in the Blessed Sacrament on earth. He would not have left us. He still offers the support of his powerful, unfailing intercession, acting as our advocate with the Father, that's uh, St. John. He aids us likewise through his church, where he is present indefectibly as the ages run their course through the church, which he constituted the pillar of truth. That's St. Paul. And dispenser of grace, in which by his sacrifice on the cross he founded, consecrated, and confirmed forever. See, that idea that is in sacred scripture, it's also in St. Paul and Hebrews, that he is, in his sacred human nature, interceding constantly for us, is the basis of his being the principal priest at Mass. See, because in baptism you say, ego te baptizo. In, in penance you say, ego te absolvo, I absolve. In the bishop says, ego te confirmo, I confirm you. But he does not say, I consecrate. But he says the actual words of Christ as if he were Christ himself saying them. And that, that is based on Christ's constant intercession according to his human nature, because obviously as God he cannot intercede. <laughs> In his sacred uh, divine nature, there's no possible intercession because he is God. But in his sacred human nature, as priest, therefore, he is um, interceding for the human race until the end of time. And that's why he retained his wounds. See, his wounds are, are the, the uh, testimony of his, his, his sacrifice and his intercession for the souls of human beings. See, it's all very deep. The, you know, the Mass is not merely a, a devotional service, you know, like the Protestants have where you get some, you, you get your faith excited. This is a really very deep theological thing that happens every morning. And it's all tied to the redemption and the incarnation, the Old Testament even. We'll see all that. See? So it's, it's good to understand this because the central thing that you will do as a priest is say Mass. And many priests do not sufficiently understand what the Mass is. It's connection to, to heaven and to everything that is. So um, that's why the new Mass is such a, a, a you know, disaster and abomination. Um, so, in effect, uh, so through uh, the pillar of truth and dispenser, we said that. Number 19, the church has therefore in common with the word incarnate the aim, the obligation, and function of teaching all men the truth. That's its sacred function, teaching all men the truth. Compare that to the Novus Ordo, Amoris Laetitia. of governing and directing them aright, canon law, all of its moral teaching, of offering to God the pleasing and acceptable sacrifice, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We have this bread to offer, work of human hands and whatnot. Wine is the work of human hands. I forget what the bread is. What is the bread? <laughs> Do you remember what the bread is? The church has given and human hands have made. Yeah, the church has given and the human hands have made. You know, we'll see that in the in the the offertory. the The offertory of the 
traditional mass is very, very important, and we'll see that later. But you're not offering just a piece of bread to God in the, you know, as, as the new mass is. Uh, in this way, the church reestablishes between the Creator and His cre creatures that unity and harmony to which the Apostle and Gentiles uh, of, excuse me, of the Gentiles alludes in these words, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and domestics of God, built upon the foundation of the Apostles and Prophets, Jesus Christ Himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, being framed together, groweth up into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are built together in a habitation of God in the Spirit. That is the mystical body of Christ. Those are extremely powerful words. You can see the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in those words. Thus the society founded by the Divine Redeemer, whether in her doctrine or in government, or in the sacrifice and sacraments instituted by Him, or finally in the ministry which he has confided to her charge with the outpouring of his prayer and the shedding of his blood has no other goal or purpose than to increase ever in strength and unity. Which is what was exactly happening under the reign of Pius XII and all of his predecessors. And then they blew it all up. The result is, in fact, achieved when Christ lives and thrives, as it were, in the hearts of men, and where men's hearts, in turn, are fashioned and expanded as though by Christ. This makes it possible for the sacred temple, where the divine majesty receives the acceptable worship which his law prescribes, to increase and proper day by, prosper day by day in this land of exile of earth. Along with the Church, therefore, her divine founder is present at every liturgical function. Christ is present at the august sacrifice of the altar, both in the person of his minister and above all under the Eucharistic species. He is present in the sacraments, infusing into them the power which makes them ready sacraments, is ready instruments of sanctification. So, for example, the water of baptism represents the blood of Christ. It would be something very difficult and repulsive to pour blood on a baby, for example. So he made it so easy with water. It would be very repulsive to actually eat the human flesh. So he put it under the species of bread and wine. See, so it's something attractive to human beings. Or the, the oil of, of confirmation, the, there is, he, the, Christ in the church is trying to attract constantly human beings, putting no obstacle in their way. Um, he is present finally in prayer of praise and petition we direct to God as it is written, where there are two or three gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Yes. Um, I forget which document, but Paul the Six, he said that uh, Christ is present in the church in six ways, and then he enumerates them. You know what I'm talking about? I generally don't read too much of the documents of Paul the Six, could you? <laughs> it, was in, it was in work with human hands. Um, but I don't think he includes in that Christ in the person of his priest. He includes in the assembly gathered. Oh, of course. Yes. Yes. He doesn't even make mention of him being. And that is, that's, a, that's, a dis, that's distinct from the way he's present in... Absolutely, absolutely. The, the traditional Mass is sacerdotal, meaning just like in the Old Testament, the priest, as we see in the, the Gospel, Zachary went in, and performed the sacrifice and all, and that's when the angel Gabriel appeared to him. It's, and the people were outside waiting, you see. And the, the, we'll see this later, but their participation is in assent and consent to what the priest is doing and offering their own uh, sacrifices with the priest, the sacrifice of the Mass and of Christ on the cross, giving them value. See, there's th their own sacrifices. See, that, that's the participation of the congregation. But congregational worship is Protestant. 
See, you are the ones doing the liturgy. The priest is there to be the referee, so to speak, or the the you know the the guidance of the of the community's worship of God. That's Protestant, 100 percent, 1,000 percent Protestant. Does that answer your question? Yes. So the the it is the priest who is acting in the person of Christ and is performing all the essential aspects of the sacrifice. That's why he says a private mass. Private mass has disappeared after the council. He says a private mass because he is involving the entire church in any case, whether it's a private mass or a big mass in a cathedral, it doesn't matter. It's always an act of the mystical body of Christ because Christ as head of the church is performing that act of consecration of the host and wine. And he is an agent of the of the mystical body of Christ in everything he does at the altar. See, it's not just some personal devotion. See, so that leaving that out is like leaving the motor out of a car. <laughs> you could have everything else. But if you do not have that representation of Christ in the Mass, and the Mass as essentially a sacerdotal act, you have missed everything. But don't forget that ecumenism was the, is, the, is the soul of all of Vatican II. Everything that Vatican II did and, and what we're living today is the effect of ecumenism. It is a poison. Uh, it is something that is, that is uh, absolutely contrary to the very nature of the church. And that's why we're seeing the, uh, before our eyes the destruction of the church day by day. I wrote about in my recent newsletter, St. Charles Borromeo Seminary. If you went, if you go down and look at it, I don't know if you can go into it, but it's it's like a it's a monument. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, it was built gradually over time, and and it was one of the biggest and nicest seminaries in this whole country. Now they're selling it to some sort of medical facility, and you, if you look on if you look up St. Charles Seminary, you'll see the new one. It looks like a house of cards. The old one is magnificent stone buildings and everything. The, it just looks like a house of cards. looks like some cheap thing. And uh, it's on, on the campus of a co-ed college. And the co-eds are going to come over to the seminary and the seminarians are going to go over to the co-eds. That, that's the plan. I mean, it's just the complete and with the introduction of Vatican II, the new mass, everything, the, the church just sinks. See, or, or the modernists, anyway. Um, so, um, so does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Did, you had a question or not? Uh, no. You you retract your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, the sacred liturgy is consequently the public worship which our Redeemer as head of the church renders to the Father. Look at that. He, as re the, the, the sacred liturgy, the Mass, is the public worship which our Redeemer as head of the church renders to the Father. Now you see the necessity of being tied to the hierarchy in that. Christ as head of the church and under him is Pope bishops, etc. So the, the priest must be acting in union with the Catholic hierarchy, and then you get into unicum. As well as the worship which the community of the faithful renders to its founder. So the people, by participating in the Mass, interiorly, primarily, internally, primarily, by assent and consent to what is happening at the altar and give their homage to God and through him to the Heavenly Father. It is, in short, the worship rendered by the mystical body of Christ in the entirety of its head and members. Very important theology of the Mass here. Extremely important theology of the Mass to understand it that way. It's not, it's not a celebration. <laughs> it, it's a, I mean, you do say celebrate Mass, but it's not a celebration in the common sense of, or a common term, as they say. If they, you know. 
it is, it is something as sacred as this. It is Christ acting in his church. And then you see the dignity of the priesthood, that by the sacrament of holy orders, you are raised to this ability to be a tool in the hand of, of Christ the Savior, like a pen in his hand. And the holier you are, the better the pen. So if you're not a very good priest, you know, there's, that means there's not a lot of ink in the pen, right? But you know, there's the, the holiness uh, uh, of the priest is going to make him all the more suitable instrument of, of Christ as head of the church. Yes? Is it true to say that that the Lord, he's the one saying the words of consecration using the lips or the, the lips and the lungs of the priest? No, it, no, he is, he is using the, you know, he's not, not doing that. He is using the, uh, and we'll see this later, we're going to explain that all later, but his, by his an act of causality, you know, he can cause anything to happen. He's, he's causing through the priest the, the, the act of consecration. He's the, the, priest's, uh, the, he's, the priest is merely an instrument of his own causality. It's like, it's like what, when you take up a pen. Okay. Yeah. It's mysterious. I mean, you know, say, how does that happen? You know, the, the Catholic faith is full of mysteries, you know, but th that is the doctrine. And we'll, we'll explain it more later, just hold on to that for a little bit. <clears throat> Not today. Uh, Christ the Lord, the eternal high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Does everyone know who Melchizedek was? All right. This as a review. Melchizedek was somebody who met up with Abraham. He, it's in Genesis. All right. And he, no one knows, he was a high priest, he's described as a high priest in Genesis. But nobody knows his origin. And he offered bread and wine, he poured out the wine and he did a sacrifice of bread and wine. And then he disappears in the sense that he, you don't hear from, about him again, ever in sacred scripture again. He doesn't disappear you know, in the sense that... You don't see him anymore. It's just he, he comes and he goes. And so St. Paul says Christ is, uh, well, the Psalms say, Psalm 109, according to the order, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That is in, is in contrast to the order of Aaron, the order of Levi. Aaron was Moses' brother. And the, uh, he Levi was his tribe, as Moses was of the tribe of Levi. The Levites come from that. Those were the people who aided in the temple. And if you were born a Levite, you were born a priest. See, you were a child, so to speak, of Aaron, who was the first priest of the old law. And you were, therefore, able to perform the sacrifices. You did not work, and you know, you didn't have a job, and you did not own land, but the rest of the tribe supported you by the 10%, the tithing, you see. So the Levites were, and some of them were something like deacons and sacristy workers. I mean, you know, there they, they were various things that they did, the Levites. So that was the Aaronic priesthood, you see, the Aaronic. That is from Aaron. But this is the order of Melchizedek. See, Melchizedek had no generation. He was chosen by God. And that's why Christ is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, not of the Aaronic priesthood. That's why that's important. And he offered, uh, the, the prefiguration is offering of bread and wine. Loving his own who were of the world, at the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, wishing to leave his beloved spouse, the church, a visible sacrifice such as the nature of men requires, that would represent 
the bloody sacrifice offered once on the cross and perpetuate its memory to the end of time and whose salutary virtue might be applied in remitting those sins which we daily commit. See, so the church is there to apply the effects of the sacrifice of the cross over time. Apply them. That's why the priesthood exists. You're applying the effects of the sacrifice of the cross. Uh, offered his body and blood under the species of bread and wine to God the Father, and under the same species allowed the apostles, whom he at, whom he at the to that time constituted the priests of the New Testament, to partake thereof, commanding them and their successors in the priesthood to make the same offering. The august sacrifice of the altar, then, is no mere empty commemoration of the passion and death of Jesus Christ, as the Protestants would have, but a true and proper act of sacrifice, whereby the high priest, by an unbloody immolation, offers himself, notice Christ, the high priest, a most acceptable victim to the Eternal Father as he did upon the cross. So there is no difference between the cross and the Mass, except that one is bloody, the other is unbloody. It is one and the same victim, and this is uh, Trent, the same person now offers it by the ministry of his priests, who then offered himself on the cross, the manner of offering alone being different. All right. The priest is the same Jesus Christ, whose sacred person his minister represents. Now the minister, by reason of the sacerdotal consecration which he has received, is made like to the high priest and possesses the power of performing actions in virtue of Christ's very person. So understand the dignity of the priesthood. Wherefore, in his priestly activity, he in a certain manner lends his tongue and gives his hand to Christ. That's St. John Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom wrote a, a, a little work on the priesthood, and I think that's available. It's very, very good to read that. He says some beautiful things about the priesthood. Don't forget, Chrysostom means golden tongue, golden mouth, golden mouth. He was, that wasn't his real last name. He was given that name, Chrysostomus, golden mouth. And he is. He's golden mouth. Got him into trouble. <laughs> he criticized the empress in front of her at mass. She deserved it. Likewise, the victim is the same, namely our Lord, uh, our divine Redeemer in his human nature with his true body and blood. The manner, however, in which Christ is offered is different. On the cross, he completely offered himself with all his sufferings to God, <coughs> and the immolation of the victim was brought about by the bloody death, which he underwent of his free will. But on the altar, by reason of the glorified state of his human nature, death shall have no dominion over him. That's Romans. And so the shedding of his blood is impossible. Still, according to the plan of divine wisdom, the sacrifice of our Redeemer is shown forth in an admirable manner by external signs which are the symbols of his death. For by the transubstantiation of bread into the body of Christ and of wine into his blood, his body and blood are both really present. Now the Eucharistic species under which he is present symbolize the actual separation of his body and blood. And we will see that later you know, how, the question is, how is the Mass a representation of Calvary? The, the very great majority opinion is that by the, the twofold consecration, you are separating sacramentally the body and blood of Christ, and that is sacramentally and in the genus of a sign, the representation or the redoing, you might say, of his death. See, the, there was no blood left in him, the complete separation of body and blood. We'll see that later. Thus, the commemorative representation of his death, which actually took place on Calvary, 
is repeated in every sacrifice of the altar, seeing that Jesus Christ is symbolically shown by separate symbols to be in the state of victimhood. So that might be a little obscure. We'll explain that later. Moreover, the appointed ends are the same. The first of these is to give glory to the Heavenly Father. So that's the first purpose of the sacrifice of the cross and of the Mass. From his birth to his death, Jesus burned with zeal for divine glory, and the offering of his blood upon the cross rose to heaven in an odor of sweetness. So the, the, what is principal in the sacrifice of Christ is his oblation, that is, the intense love and obedience that he had for his Father that he would go through that for him, to carry out the redemption of the human race by that means, and that means was the means intended by God for, uh, because it was the best of all. It was God could have just forgotten about everybody's sins. No, it's all right. So he could have done that, but because God does things perfectly, the perfect reparation was a human sacrifice and a sacrifice that had to be infinite in its effects because human mortal sin is infinite in a certain way. That is, it is measured by the person who is offended and it becomes, in that sense, an infinite effect, uh, uh, yes, an infinite offense. So even if the whole human race from Adam right to the end, consented to be crucified on the cross in reparation for sin that would not have been sufficient to make reparation for the sins of human beings. And not only is the, the reparation of Christ sufficient for all the sins of mankind, but even for those sins which mankind will not actually commit. So the um, <clears throat> let's see where we are. Um, so the, the the point is, see, Luther saw uh, God the Father as angry with the human race because of sin, and took it out on his son. So he poured down all of this horror and passion and death upon his son in sort of a, a fit of anger. Take this, take that, as if he were yelling at the human race. And then that means the debt is paid and we don't have to worry about it anymore. See, so just have faith that you've been redeemed and you're okay. God understands you can't keep the commandments anyway. That's what he says. You could fornicate a thousand times a day and not be separated from Christ as long as you have faith. Quote from Luther. See, but the, so he neglects the whole idea of the oblation. In other words, what God is pleased by, God the Father is pleased by, is not the, the, the blood and, and gore of the crucifixion, but he's pleased by that act of obedience of his son to him to accomplish this task. Don't forget, it was by disobedience of one man that sin entered the world, St. Paul, and it is by the obedience of Christ that it has been obliterated. So it was this act of obedience. That's why the agony in the garden, where he accepts the, the cross, not my will, but thine be done. And he did that purposely to show us that we can be tempted not to do the will of God. You see? And, you know, he, he foresaw all of his sufferings, and, but he said, not my will, but thine be done. That is the, the, a key point in, in, the, in the passion, his giving of obedience to God, to be subject to the will of God, even when it, it involves, say, martyrdom or something like that. All right. We'll stop there today.
we stop here.